Okay, so we are live now. Yes, you can Good. take over. We are live now. Awesome. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world tonight. And a very happy World Oceans Day to all of you. And a very warm welcome to day four of the third in international conference and pop festival. Sorry, to the day four of the third international conference and pop festival for youth led climate action 2021. We are absolutely delighted to have you all join for one of the biggest youth led events for climate action. My name is Steph and I am the founder of Seeds of Change Australia. The POP family is excited to welcome you to this panel discussion on marine biodiversity and threats. We are very happy to have all of you join us for this very meaningful conversation. In this session, youth leaders from various countries will present their ocean action and advocacy projects and attempt to showcase the positive impacts that their approaches can have on protecting ocean health and its ecosystem. Before we start, we would like to mention a series of indications. P kindly keep your microphone switched off to avoid background noise. Please feel free to use Zoom, the Zoom chat to send in your questions. Our facilitators will help us coordinate to respond to your queries. We would also like to share our social media handles to keep you informed about our future activities, which you can find in the chat. We also invite you to use hashtags and sharing festival content on networks. And if you are posting anything from your account, please use the has hashtags also mentioned in the chat. Finally, you can sign up for the special workshops organized by POP partners that will take place during the POP festivals, which will also be available in the chat. We look forward to seeing you all and engaging with each one of you through the next six days of the festival. Once again, a warm welcome to everyone. This session will witness the coming together of expert panelists from different parts of the world who will discuss and shed light on the importance of marine biodiversity, the threats faced by it, and some of the effective solutions that can be implemented to protect it. The session will bring in the perspectives of different stakeholders from environmental experts to organizations focused on marine conservation, leaders and youth advocates. The session will conclude with an interactive dialogue between the participants and the panelists with a focus on identifying different strategies and solutions that can be adopted for the conservation of our marine biodiversity. I'd like to begin by quickly introducing each panelist we have joining us today. Dr. Christine, is a marine conservation biologist and ocean advocate who is passionate about conserving sea turtles, fighting plastic pollution, and empowering women in STEM. For over 15 years, Christine has applied her research globally to the conservation of sea turtles. She was thrust into the international spotlight in 2015 when she captured her research team in Costa Rica, removing a plastic straw from a sea turtle's nose on film. The video quickly went viral and was leading and led to a, was a catalyst for the global anti-straw movement. As a result, global businesses, including Starbucks, Alaska Airlines and Disney, removed plastic straws from their product offerings. She is still actively involved in sea turtle conversation for a Costa Rican nonprofit, Coast. Utuma Anderson is the volunteers coordinator and is involved with many of the community engagement projects for the Poverty Foundation. She lives in Toronto and is one of the original 10 members who watched the Marine Arctic Peace Sanctuary. We also have joining us Miss Maria Lopez, um, who is an ocean advocate and a non-profit technology professional who weaves her passion for equal representation in leadership into all facets of her career. Inspired by her passion for the ocean, Ms. Lopez founded Blue Earth Future, a company dedicated to supporting the UN's SDG goals through corporate advisory and consultation. She has been an avid scuba diver for more than 20 years and has a master's in marine conservation and education. Ms. Lopez is the president of Amplify, a non-profit organization that empowers underrepresented voices to be fearless leaders in tech. And finally, we have Salma, who is 23 years old and is an undergraduate student of marine biology. 
She is currently working as the coordinator of the education and community outreach in SOA, Mexico, and working on her bachelor thesis with Blue Whales on the National Park of Loreto Bay. In the last six years, she has been volunteering with different NGOs due to her passion for wildlife conservation. She is very interested in defending the conservation of wildlife through in, in environmental education and firmly believes that there is still hope for a better world where humans can live in harmony with the environment and wildlife that surrounds us. Thank you all for joining us today and for giving up your precious time to sh share your wisdom. To begin the panel discussion, I'd like to ask all our panelists, what does the ocean mean to you? Maybe we can start with Christine. Yeah, um, what does the ocean mean to me? I think I would consider it my first love. I don't want to say my only love because some people might get offended, but um, it is definitely my first love. So for me, it means, you know, I can come to a place where I can just like, you know, relax and where I can be myself and um, enjoy the underwater world. And I think it's just a big passion and fascination of what's going on in the ocean that has me led down my path of what I became as a marine biologist. So yeah, my first love, I still love it. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, Utama, would you like to also answer that question for us? Might want to unmute. Um, to me, the ocean is uh, everything. It's it's the unifying uh, substance and being that is is the planet. You know, there is only one ocean technically, and uh, it's it's everywhere. And truly, what with I mean, without the ocean, there would be no Earth. Uh, but yeah, I find it's it is everything to all people if only they knew you know so we can help yeah them. yes i love that perspective thank you so much for sharing it with us um marissa would you like to also answer that question for us please definitely thanks stephanie um and exactly what christine and utama said it just really resonates with me the ocean is a source of so many things it's life uh it is it's a source of inspiration. It's a source of fun and joy and beauty and amazement and awe. Uh, anyone that has spent time either on, on the coast or at the beach or on the ocean or under the water knows that it, it, it's just incredible and inspiring and surprising. <laughs> there's a lot of surprises and there's a lot of magic, I will say. I know that on World Ocean Day, we are really focused on conservation and there's a lot of very hard truths about where we are as humans in our relationship with the ocean. But I think it's really important to start with remembering and thinking about the beauty and the mystery and all, all the, it really is magic. Um, I, I think anyone who has spent time on the ocean will say that as well. There are so many things that you see and experience that are beyond your wildest imaginations. Uh, when, you, when you think about the ocean, that it's a really special place. It's a source of life. It's a source of survival, food, um, our <laughs> air, right? Everything that we need as humans is uh, inextricably tied to the ocean. So I really can't say enough about it and look forward to elaborating uh, more on some of these topics. But thanks so much for having us here. Thank you. You're so welcome. And... Um, finally, would Salma like to answer that question too, please? Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. For me, the oceans means, well, three of the four parts of the planet are ocean and water. Also, life begins there in the ocean. So for me, the ocean is where everything starts. Life begins there. We also depend in this because, well, um, water... No, weather and climate is regulated by the ocean. And also there are so many species that live there. So for me, the ocean it is, I am agree with all the panelists that it is magic, it is passion, it is wonderful. 
Thank you. And thank you all for sharing your perspective on that topic and just sharing how beautiful our oceans truly are. The next question I'd like to ask all of you is if you could share a little bit about how you um, got involved in this industry and was this always your career path or did you have a big moment of realisation that led you into uh, this uh, area of career? Uh, so could we maybe start with Utama? Sure. Um, well, my, uh, my career is an art therapist, which is why I have a jumble behind me, but my life is dedicated to uh, realizing the Marine Arctic Peace Sanctuary. So it started because uh, my friend and colleague Parvati had a dream of a blue whale swimming beneath her while she lay on ice on the top of the ocean. She kept having it. And she finally turned to her music manager and said, I, I think we have to go to the North Pole. <laughs> and uh, three weeks later, they were in the North Pole. Um, but it was a call that she had from the whales. And uh, it's had several dreams that have helped her uh, see where where it was where the need was and so based on that we we've all been acting ever since understanding how well, how important it is to protect the arctic ocean so thank you for sharing that with us marissa would you like to share your story too please yeah i'd be happy to and um i think utama that's a really interesting a uh, perspective that you share of the ocean <laughs> calling her and calling you uh, because I, I felt, had a similar experience. I feel drawn to the ocean, but I, I, also, I feel pulled to it. <laughs> and I, I have, I've kind of lost my way on that path a couple of times and every time been pulled back. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's definitely a force that is perhaps stronger than us as individuals. And I, I say that from a very, very real perspective. So um, my, my path has been a little bit rambling. I was um, first became, the, the way I got into conservation was through scuba diving. Uh, so I was very, well, I guess I've always been very adventurous, but I was particularly adventurous as a, as a young adult and uh, wanted to learn how to scuba dive and went to, uh, enrolled in a, a program at Santa Barbara City College in Southern California to get a scuba instructor uh, certification. And that really started with a lot of diving in the very rugged kelp forests um, in the Channel Islands and off of, off of Santa Barbara. So I, in retrospect, many years later, I feel very fortunate that I started diving in cold water in the Pacific, because many years later, when I started to dive in warmer waters <laughs> in the Caribbean and other places, I realized that it's much easier to do so. So it was good to, to be a little naive and uh, start with the harder diving and where you have to have a thicker web suit. But I, as soon as I went underwater in the kelp forest, I, I like Christine describes, I, I literally fell in love. <laughs> so I literally fell in love with the ocean and the experience of being underwater and in the ocean. Uh, when you are in under the kelp canopy, there's this light that shines through the kelp and you just literally see rays of light and it's very angelic. And then juxtapose with that sort of mystical beauty are these really rugged fish, right? Sheep's head and um, Garibaldi and, you know, urchins and, and these kind of critters uh, that, that are grimy, but the, it's very beautiful, right? It's beautiful to see the orange fish against the kelp water and the light shining through and being cold and feeling salty and you're always sort of moving because the water is always moving even under the surface. So there's a lot of different sensations in that experience of diving, hearing your own breath is very meditative. Um, well, at the same time, so it's relaxing. Well, at the same time, you are incredibly alert because there's so many different factors to keep track of how long you've been at depth, um, what is going around, on, on around you. Um, 
all the creatures that you're watching, keeping track of your buddies. So I, I find scuba diving to be a very magical experience. And that was my, my entry into the ocean, uh, was with diving and going out and being on boats and interacting with the other young people in the program that I was at. Um, and it, most of them were going into becoming commercial divers to go work on oil rigs, which was also an interesting <laughs> conversation to have um, because that can be very destructive to our environment. So, so from there, I absolutely fell in love. I um, have never really fallen out of love with the ocean, whether I was close or far to it or inland or in the mountains. And um, my career path has been rambling. So from getting involved with scuba diving and becoming a dive instructor, going to the Caribbean, working on boats, uh, becoming a dive instructor is a fantastic thing to do if you can do it at some point in your life, because you can travel all over the world um, and see all kinds of amazing things. It took me to the Galapagos. It took me to, to the Caribbean. Um, I got to, like I said, experience a lot of cold water diving and then a lot of warm water diving after that, which was much easier, uh, so to speak. And I went into, I I was so inspired. I decided to continue my education and get a master's in marine conservation and education uh, through Prescott College, which is actually in Arizona, but they have a field station down in the Gulf of California, which was absolutely incredible. And I don't want to take too much of everybody's time, but I have all kinds of amazing stories to, to study, to talk about down there. Uh, we went out on a, a trawler and watched uh, the you know, the bottom of the ocean raked <laughs> for shrimp um, and all kinds of fish and bycatch being pulled up and how destructive that is. So I've had a lot of really interesting experiences. Uh, life did lead me in a different direction um, a couple of, about a decade, decade and a half ago, and I got into tech technology. So I actually work professionally in the nonprofit technology space, as you mentioned, Stephanie, during the introduction. Uh, but again, uh, even when I've left the ocean, she's called me back. So I have a lot of opportunity to volunteer in this space, to be involved with uh, youth climate action uh, with POP, uh, with the POP network has been really fantastic. And I'm involved now with uh, local programs here in St. Thomas to do beach cleanups and plastic reduction, as well as a lot of global initiatives. But I will say that whether you are a professional working in marine science or marine policy or education, or you are an artist or you're in technology, regardless of anyone's profession, there is room and you are in the conservation space and you are needed. So I really believe that everybody needs to be part of this effort to protect our ocean, regardless of what your career is or your background uh, or your age or where you are in the world. So I hope everyone can join this movement. Thank, Thank you, you for saying, and I really love how both you and Utama, um can show like just how like your career path can be um, on a completely different lens to your conservation work, but you can balance both those. And I think as a young person, it's really inspiring to see that you can strike a balance between those two. Um, Salma, would you also like to answer that question for us, please? Yeah, so I was born in Mexico City, which is the capital of Mexico. There is no ocean, but my family and I often went to the beaches of Acapulco, which is in the Pacific side. And then when I was three years old, we moved to the beautiful state of Baja California Sur in the Gulf of California area. And well, I was surrounded by ocean on the three sides. So I think that being in contact with the ocean since I was a baby gave me this passion for all things related to the ocean. And with the time, this passion grew over the years. So I started a career path as marine biologist and tried to participate in conservation efforts. Thank you. And finally, Christine, would you like to answer that question? Christine, you're muted. Yeah, my career path was probably 
pretty uh, straight uh, compared maybe to other people because um, I was pretty early on sure of what I wanted to become and that was an ocean explorer. Um, actually, recently, a friend of mine has commented on it. I hadn't even thought about it, but she said, you know, you knew already in kindergarten what you wanted to be and nobody believed you. But because, you know, you have these ideas of becoming a firefighter or a police officer or whatever, a pilot. And then, of course, life turns out to be a little bit different. But yeah, I actually grew up in Germany in a super landlocked town uh, which was known for coal mining so not very pretty area uh, and I think my parents uh, always had the urge to get out of that area for vacation and in Europe it's not that far to get to the ocean I mean Germany has you know borders with nine different countries so you could literally go up in the north we have our own two coastlines you could go to the Netherlands to France to Spain it's all pretty much around the corner and my first vacation at the ocean was about when I was about one or two years old in um, former Yugoslavia and I remember that I wasn't super keen on going into the water because there was something under the surface that seemed a little scary to a two-year-old you know I mean I was a tiny, tiny person and um, there was some critters under the wave lines. And it was really funny because my dad is this typical German engineer, very rational. And I guess I had some tantrums about going into the water and he was not very amused about it. So he went up to the concession stands in, um, you know, that was a tourist area and bought me a pair of like, kind of swimming goggles and said, you know what, there's nothing to be scared of. Just look at it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was kind of where I started to look and I was absolutely fascinated by it and then it was more of a reverse that they had to trouble dragging me out of the water even though you know my lips were blue already I did not want to leave um, but that is probably the moment where I fall in the fall in love with the ocean and um I, I think my parents caught on to that very early on. So I got, you know, swimming lessons. I was very involved in, 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 um, in yeah, water rescue in Germany. And also my dad always showed me all these old documentaries of Hans Haas, which is kind of the Austrian James um, uh, Jacusto and Jacusto, of course, himself. And when I was about 13 years old, I started volunteering for a local aquarium um, where I was also in contact with a lot of biologists that did their studies there and so I really early on also had an idea of how I would be an ocean explorer and that this is actually called marine biology and how I could become one and um, so I think the next years were all about kind of you know paving my career path so for example I learned that most of the science is done in English and so I did put a lot of effort into improving my English because English is not my native language obviously uh, so I went for an exchange year in, in the U.S. And then, um, yeah, when I studied later on, I also had the chance to go, for example, to Egypt for a few months uh, to the Red Sea, where I actually got my scuba certification. And it was just, yeah, I mean, I don't think I ever swayed from that path. It, of course, hasn't always been easy um, because, of course, I remember when we were studying as undergrads, people were like, ah, marine biology, you just want to play with the dolphins. And this is like a job where you won't make any money. And why don't you want to become a geneticist or microbiologist? That's where the money is. And, you know, everybody wants to be a marine biologist, but nobody actually does it. And I was just kind of trying to, you know, to, to kind of zone out and not listen to the people and just did my thing you know I just did my thing and kind of let the naysayers do their thing and um, well here I am right now so I have in the meantime a PhD in marine biology and when about 15 years ago I moved to Costa Rica to start working in marine conservation um, mainly sea turtles I also did some years of, of work on dolphins and whales and yeah it's just it's just a very fulfilling work. And I have to say, I don't want to change with anybody in the world. I have these incredible national geographic moments that, you know, I don't know. It's, it's so difficult to relate if you're not in the situation. I mean, I think Marissa did a really amazing job of describing the kelp forest. I'm actually super jealous. I've never been that's like one, of my, one, one big thing on my bucket list to go and dive in the kelp forest. 
But um, of course, it also has very, very harsh realities where you're coming on, you know, we're definitely getting to know very ugly sides of humanity, um, which, you know, might counterbalance those National Geographic moments. But of course, in the mornings, I know what I'm getting up for and I know what I'm fighting for. And I'm just trying very, very hard to, you know, make it possible for future generations to have those National Geographic moments as well, because, I mean, of course, we all depend on it, but as a person and as individuals, I think it is so incredible to see all the, all the mysteries, all the adventures that the ocean can offer. And yeah, that's more or less my story in a nutshell, I guess. Thank you. Thank you to all four of you for sharing such personal anecdotes of us. It's great to see the um, quite large range of experiences in this industry. Um, my final like group question is, um, what do you believe to be the current state of our marine biodiversity? And are there any specific challenges or solutions that you wish to highlight? Um, Marissa, would you like to start us off with this, please? Absolutely. Um, thanks, Stephanie. And yeah, it's great to hear these these common the common threads, right? The, before I jump into that, uh, there's again part of the part of the ocean that's just it's hard to explain, and that's that's where the artists and the musicians and the creatives come in, right? That's why it's really important to have. Uh, the other perspectives other than just the facts we need the science and we need to listen to the science but we also need to listen to the muses uh, and the fishermen and anyone who tells stories about the ocean I think storytelling is very very important uh, because there aren't that, that's the way that we share I, I want to say um, you know as we start thinking about threats to marine di biodiversity uh, there are many people who don't have access to the ocean either folks are inland or <clears throat> surprisingly, uh, even in island nations, a lot of, if you do not know how to swim, the ocean is a very, very scary place. Um, so not everybody has access to the experiences that um, some of us have been talking about how we've fallen in love and been really enchanted. And I think that's really important to remember as we talk about the threats um, and the beauty of the ocean. So. I think your, your question is what are, what are the biggest threats and concerns to biodiversity um, and what are the opportunities there? Is that what it was? Yes. So okay. what are your, um, what solutions would you like to highlight? Okay. That, that's great. So I think the the current state of, of marine biodiversity is actually a, a pretty scary one. <laughs> uh, the world, is, the, the ocean is being overfished. Um, there are a lot of threats, right? There's overfishing, there's global warming, warming of the oceans. Um, there's many threats to the diversity of wildlife in our ocean. Uh, and because of that, uh, we really have to focus on the opportunities and what we can do uh, to mitigate those threats. So my belief is that there's global solutions and then there's also community-based solutions. And I think there needs to be more focus on both. I do believe that communities know how, for the most part, um, to manage uh, their ecosystems and to manage their food sources. And I would like to see more global support of local initiatives. So one of the initiatives that is being pushed in um, this decade of ocean science that we're in is uh, protecting more of our oceans. So there is a large initiative to protect 30% of the ocean worldwide. And uh, you'll, you'll see 30, 20, 30, many places. I think that's gonna be a big theme uh, this year and today in World Ocean Day. So I think that's really important. Um, and a, another uh, important initiative is just focusing on the blue economy. What does that mean? Uh, you'll hear blue economy in many places and you'll see it referenced, but it's really important to note that the blue economy 
refers to sustainable ocean growth activities, right? So the economy related to the ocean that is sustainable. And that's the piece that a lot of folks miss. So as we're looking at tourism, fishing, um, any other sort of lucrative financially gaining opportunities related to the ocean, it's important to also look at them through the lens of what can continue on, what is sustainable over the course of time. And that's where I think there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of really fantastic research being done and initiatives around the blue economy. Uh, and we can continue to press forward and continue to think about how our work and how our financial gain is sustainable and continues to protect the ocean. Stephanie, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us and um, teaching everyone about the blue economy. That's so interesting. Um, Christine, would you also like to answer that question? I'll repeat it for you. Um, what do you believe to be the current state of our marine biodiversity? And are there any specific challenges or solutions that you wish to highlight? Yeah, I think the state of the biodiversity is actually really, first of all, really hard to, to gauge. Because interestingly, we, you know, there's this kind of uh, saying that we know more about space than we know about our oceans. So we really don't know the state of our biodiversity because we have never had an accurate baseline of what it might have been. Um, you know, it looked very different probably a few hundred years ago before industrial fisheries started, before ocean shipping started, before all the colonies started conquering different countries on the seaway. Um, because I mean, just as an example from, from sea turtles, I actually just had a talk with uh, somebody that is doing the hawksbill initiative and hawksbills are a critically endangered species, which I estimated to have about maybe between 10,000 and 25,000 nesting females left in the world. And, you know, just recently there was a study that came out where they looked at, um, at uh, old oxbow shell that was still in storage in countries and estimated based on the DNA of like how many oxbows that derived from. And we're talking there about millions. So, you know, millions of oxbows at one point a few hundred years ago were killed. So that means there must have been that amount of oxbows out there, but we don't know, right? Because it's already gone. So. I think that is the scariest thing that we don't even know how much damage we have already done, especially also in you know the deep seas and everything. And the other challenges, of course, that people tend to forget that we can govern terrestrial habitats very easily because all of our you know of our Earth, uh, at least the solid ground, belongs to a country, to a government, to a government that can actually decide, make decisions about that area or habitat. But in the case of the ocean, we only have a certain amount of the ocean that belongs to a certain country. And then we're talking about international waters that are the high seas, whatever you want to call it. And that is pretty much a no man's land. It's, it's a no rule, nothing is going on. So there's a lot of debate of how can we even govern this vast amount of ocean you know, without any country trying to maybe monopolize it or else. Um, so it's a very, very, di very difficult landscape to even do conservation. And that is also where then, for example, you know, things like industrial fishery. So there is actually economies that are totally banking on that fact that they cannot be governed and nobody can tell them what to do, at least not while they're in the high seas, um, to make their money off of that. And so there is this conflict and I wish we would come up. So that's the thing, that's the challenge. And I would really love to come up with an idea of an agreement of how we can really execute, not just like, you know, kind of some lip service. Oh, we're going to have this protected area in the middle of nowhere, but who is actually going to execute it, right? Because that's, that's really the challenge um, that for the sake of our oceans, we're able in between countries to come up with agreements and, and, and also the tools to really, really, really do something out in the high seas. Because, you know, even sea turtles might nest in Costa Rica, but they're highly migratory. So they're using exactly those international waters. And so do so many large predator and also fish species that we are depending on 
for protein, for food and all of that. And um, the other thing is, of course, the ocean shipping that's also using the high seas, right? So there's so much that needs to be regulated and we need to come up with an idea of how to do that. Christine, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. Sorry, Stephanie, I wanted to, to make a point for folks. I don't know if everybody is aware, but the high seas is the part of the ocean where basically there aren't any countries that own it, <laughs> right? So it's not in any of the econ exclusive economic zones and it's not in anyone's territory. And so, and Christine, you're welcome to jump in afterwards, but I think that's why one of the one of the many reasons it's very challenging is there's huge swaths of ocean that don't technically belong to any country, but they of course belong to uh, all of us, right? And it's very important, but it's hard to make rules there. So there's attempts to make a bunch of international agreements, um, but, but it's also sort of a no man's land. Would you, would is, is that is that accurate? Because I want to make sure not everyone knows about sort of marine policy and governance of the sea, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I explained that in the beginning, but yeah, thank you. Yes, okay, good. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Christine, for sharing and also Marissa for clarifying that for everyone else. Thank you. Um, Utama, would you also like to share your perspective on this topic, please? Yes, thank you. I mean, um, you're asking about marine biodiversity and I would say that at this point in time on the planet, every Every being is, uh, and all diversity is at stake. There is, um, we're at a tipping point now, and we, we have very little time left. And what we, our Poverty Foundation has done is they took a look at the um, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which says that every country has jurisdiction for, uh, uh, over 200 nautical miles offshore from the edge of their land into the ocean. And then as Christine and Marissa are talking about, then there's the high seas beyond that. But truly, if you're thinking about the damage that's done, it's mostly close to shore. You know, this, the kind of fishing where they're dragging the nets across the bottom of the ocean and ruining that environment is done close to shore. And in the case of the Arctic, there are, um, you know, it's, it's been frozen. It's been a, a, a pristine natural sanctuary for millennia. And only now that at this critical point when it's melting so quickly at 14,000 tons per second, that's how fast the ice is melting in the Arctic per second, 14,000 tons. So at this particular time, all of a sudden you know, we've got military going in there with nuclear submarines and fishing vessels because countries are investing in these huge icebreakers that can chomp through 10 foot thick ice um, and clearing ways for large ships to go through there uh, because of the melt and so on. So what was always quiet for one thing has now become very noisy and there's seismic testing because oil and gas companies are wanting to drill there um, and on it goes. So what we've done is we've created, we wrote an international treaty that declares all waters north of the Arctic Circle to be a marine Arctic sanctuary. And um, that would require all commercial activity to be out of the Arctic Ocean um, so that we can preserve um, really the planet's air conditioning system that regulates all of our weather, whether it's ocean currents or it's air currents, that temperature is set in the Arctic and uh, then is shared around the world. But if it starts off even a couple of degrees warmer than usual, it, it exacerbates things all over the world, including, you know, washing against Europe's coast and and the temperatures higher become, um, you know, more unusual weather, but you keep going and you go into the African nations and there's um, the kind of too much rain or too little rain became, depending on the area. And it becomes that you can't grow crops there or locusts are, are fostered because there's the perfect climate for 
swarms and swarms of locusts come in and eat out food off the ground um, and on and on. So this marine Arctic peace sanctuary is meant to be um, our, and, and will be our uh, planet's savior. It's where we begin. It's the most important action we can take to begin is to set up the marine Arctic peace sanctuary. And then at that point, of course, all regional efforts are important too, but we need that overriding global sanctuary to, um, to allow the planet to regulate and get back to some kind of a rhythm that it was, that it was meant to be. So that's what we're lobbying for. We figure we have about two years um, left to get that established. So that's what we're working on day and night. And uh, signing the petition would be very, very welcome at parvati.org. Um, yeah. That, thank you so much for sharing that. That's such an uh, amazing initiative. Maybe if you can put the link in the chat so everyone can sign it for you. I'm sure everyone will get behind that. Uh, and finally, I'd really love to call on Sama for you to also share your um, opinion and beliefs on this question. Yes, I think that pollution, overfishing, climate change, and other human activities like these massive oil splits are one of the biggest treatments that the ocean is facing nowadays. But of course, you don't have to need you don't have to need to be like a passionate or in love with the ocean to figure out these problems. You we need to be more conscious that this is a, that of course this is our planet, but it does not belong to us. It belongs to all species and the coming generations that live here so need so we need to be more conscious about the different perspectives of the ocean for example i see like so many different comments in the chat about overfishing and of course this is one of the biggest problems but if you see and if you talk with fisheries around the fishermen around the world there are so many fishermen that recognize when a fish has it and they Tell that of course we need to protect the fishes, but so many people depend on the, the food and of the economic of this industry. So it is especially need to develop and be natural protected areas, respect the size of the fishes, respect stop throwing like a massive pollution, massive trash to the ocean plastics. Thank you so much for sharing that and thank you to all of you for also um, sharing your work and your concerns as well and I love how varied it is here to have so many experts in the room. Um, so I'd now like to ask you all, I have Sorry, can I just make a really quick comment because I see that it's coming down to the film Seaspiracy again and I think I want to say it officially here right now. I mean, and it's a great starting point to dive into ocean conservation, but I would really, really, really like to invite people to dive deeper than that because that film only scratched the surface. And, you know, it is making a one big problem as the only problem, which is not true. So our ocean has more than just one apocalyptic writer that is threatening, you know, the, the livelihood of everyone. And I think that we need to, you know, pick our fight. So it is not that one cause is worthier than another. So if Utama, for example, wants to fight for the Arctic or Antarctic and does a sanctuary there, or like I'm really involved in plastic and somebody else is in fisheries, that is that are all legit causes that, you know, are threatening or like that are trying to solve the problem or the problems that are facing our ocean. So just because we're already having like a very animated chat about it, I just want to say conspiracy is not the end of all and doesn't explain everything that's going on. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think that is uh, a very, very good way to put it. It's a great eye opener, but definitely not the place to stop. Um, so I'd really like to ask um, all four of you like an individual question, like based off um, your work. So. Um, if possible, I'd like to start with you, Christine. Um, so um, seeing as you do so much groundwork and research in the field, what is your perspective on the impact of human activity on marine biodiversity? 
Well, I think we are the cause of a lot of the problems that I just mentioned. Um, so if you think about, you know, the, the, the biggies, um, so kind of just to summarize, it is climate change, um, rising sea level, you know, rising ocean acidification because of that. Um, then we have ocean pollution, fertilizers, pesticides that are ending up in our ocean. We have fishing and overexploitation, especially on the industrial level. And I think that is one super important point as well, that you know, small scale fishermen are not usually the problem. It's the large industri industrial fishing that is the problem. And then of course, invasive species as well that are you know, carried because of ocean transportation into different ocean basins and are causing havoc in the you know, native local ecosystems. And if you think about it, all the things I just mentioned, um, we are definitely responsible for climate change. Um, our carbon footprint and you know, our carbon emissions are the ones that are causing global warming and other effects of, of climate change. Um, we are also the ones that are doing you know, bad farming practices um, and other pollutions like oil spills are also our, our responsibility. We are also responsible for, over, for the overexploitation of species and the fishing. And we are also responsible to carry invasive species into areas where they shouldn't be. Um, well, actually, those species are probably not invasive in where they came from. So it's usually, you know, non-native species that turn into an invasive species. So, I mean, yes, we are the root of all the evil, if you want so. But I think we can also be the solution. So since we are an intelligent species, we are we are aware of all those facts. So that means we we already know what, what is causing it. So we are also in the power to stop doing what we're doing and reversing all of that. So sometimes I'm a little worried when we say sustainable um, because sustain, sustainable means we sustain the status quo pretty much of what it is. So sometimes I would love to talk more about restoration because I said already we have no idea what the ocean might have looked like a hundred years ago when it was probably healthier than it is nowadays. So sustainability is great, but actually I would love to even go back in time and restore what we have destroyed already, which is difficult. But um, I mean, we cost it, so we have to do the reparation payments. And that might also mean that we have to be a little bit inconvenienced, but it is our lifeline, right? So as Dr. Sylvia Earl put it very well, every drop we drink, every breath we take, we're connected to our oceans. Our oceans produce our oxygen. 50 to 80% comes from our oceans. So they are literally our, our blue lungs. And we need to wake up. We need to wake up and see it as what it is. It's, it's, it's what we, we live on. Our entire humanity depends on the ocean. Thank you so much. That is um, so um, educational to, to share that um, great complexity of the issue. Uh, I think it's um, the idea of restoration instead of sustainability is um, something that I will definitely be looking into and I hope everyone else um, watching will also take that advice. So thank you so much for sharing. Ultima, I would like to ask you, um, working specifically in the Arctic, can you explain the effect of the, um, of the Arctic on marine biodiversity and the importance of protecting this area? Uh, you're on mute, Ultima. Uh, we are focused on the Arctic Ocean because it's, it's the regulator for the whole planet. But of course, we don't go there to do that so much, but it is our focus. But our other and equally, probably going dovetailing totally into what Christine is saying, is that we cannot, we, the Marine Arctic Peace Sanctuary is two things. It's a geographical area, but it's also a shift in humanity's um, way of thinking. We focus on what we call of interconnection. You know, people used to believe that the planet was flat and then they, they started to understand, oh, we live on a round planet. But now we have to understand that it's not just uh, round, but it's, it's um, interconnected. We live in a web and, you know, of interconnection. So we're all just drops in the ocean and what one person does affects the whole. And once we understand that we're all interconnected, then when we truly understand that we can no longer do harm 
because harm to any other living being is harm to ourselves. Um, so our focus is two things. One is to talk to government, heads of government in the United Nations around the treaty, but it's also a grassroots and much more important, a grassroots um, plan that we have unfolding through music, through um, books, and through uh, various videos and yoga, all kinds of things where we're encouraging people to understand that we're all interconnected. And so it's that sort of uh, dual um, uh, effort on behalf of all beings that we are able to see that we can leave nature in the Arctic to regenerate. And we know that there is all kinds of regenerative powers. Think of, um, I think of a land story of the wolves being reintroduced into the Yellowstone Park. You know, they'd been hunted to extinction in the 1920s. And um, when they were reintroduced, the whole ecosystem rebalanced, you know, and things became uh, less erosion, uh, less destructive. And so it, it will be the same with the Arctic Ocean, but only because it's the regulator for the whole planet. And of course that will affect all, because as Christine says, 50% or more of our oxygen comes from the phytoplankton that whales totally support and that it's all interconnected. It just goes on and on. I think anyone and all of you that are so involved in directly in the ocean know everything's connected. There's not one little being that isn't affecting everything else. As I just mentioned the phytoplankton on through zooplankton and to blue whales, you know, everything in between. So thank you for that. I appreciate um, being able to point out actually James Gustav Speff. Now, if I can remember exactly what is his title, founder of the United, something about natural resources, but he said, you know, he always thought that the biggest problem that we had was, was um, conservation and climate change and so on. But he realized that the real, the real problem we have is, is um, a sense of, of greed really and, and of apathy and not understanding that we're all interconnected. So, so that's what our focus is on and uh, we're optimistic. Thank you so much for sharing that, that um, perspective on interconnectivity and um, how humanity um, sometimes has that dark side to it and how we can change, move from apathy um, is um, really great. And I think that's really beneficial for all of our listeners today. Um, I'd also like to move on to Marissa now and ask, um, being in the commercial space, how do you believe the blue economy supports marine biodiversity? Thanks. That's a that's an interesting question. So as I had mentioned, I um I am in the the tech space. I'm in the corporate <laughs> space, really, uh, professionally. And <clears throat> um, but I continue to be drawn back to the ocean. And I live on an island, so I can look at the ocean every day. Um, so Christine made a really good point. Um, when I mentioned blue economy, I said it's sustainable, but you're right. We need to go beyond <laughs> sustainable because what are we sustaining right now? We're state sustaining uh, an ocean that is probably not in its optimal state, right? Uh, we, can, we can do better than that. So I think the blue economy, um, just coming from a business perspective, the hard reality is that humans, uh, as people, you know, we a lot of what we do is is collectively is driven uh, by money and by finances. And so, looking at ways to create or to um, improve economies uh, and make them <clears throat> work in compliance with what is best for the ocean, I think, is really important because many people actually just have no choice but to focus on sort of their bottom line. Um, so in the, I'm in the Caribbean and the, the approach that I think would be most helpful to, from a, you know, business economic perspective, focus on our, uh, our oceans is to really, again, put more emphasis on, uh, at least in this region, grassroots efforts to fund, um, initiatives that, uh, stem 
from local people in the islands. Um, there's a lot of colonialism here and there's a lot of top down sort of efforts. So there's a lot of, you know, other countries and other regions coming in and pushing onto these small island nations, what they think is beneficial um, for the people here, um, for the, the ecosystems, um, for conservation, for, for uh, you know, getting money out of these areas. And my perspective is that we need to change the way that we are doing conservation. And again, I'm focusing on this region specifically to how do big global organizations and how do big corporations that have the finances to, um, to regenerate <laughs> uh, the ocean perhaps, or at least the economies related to it, how can we, those big global initiatives look at the local initiatives and make local conservationists and local fishermen uh, and local people, the center and the leaders of this initiative and how do we support that, right? Because too often what I see happening and I don't think it works and I don't think it will work going forward is when big global initiatives, big global conservation groups, when big global governments uh, come in and try to push onto local communities, what they think is best for the region, that doesn't end up being correct. And it also does not give uh, local people enough of a voice um, and enough influence, enough power over what is happening in their communities. And by communities, I mean terrestrial communities, I mean ocean communities, that's all tied in together. So I am really looking at local leaders um, there's a couple of folks that, that I wanted to highlight here. Um, I, I, I'm a big uh, supporter of Vita Wade, who wrote uh, a framework for the equitable um, blue economy, focused in the Caribbean, uh, and is look, researching and taking initiative to find ways to refocus blue economy building on local communities. Um, and finding pathways for international organizations to help fund those initiatives, but not necessarily drive those initiatives. There's a huge difference. Um, Khadija Stewart, so Vita Wade of Fish and Fins, uh, Khadija, she's in Montserrat. Uh, Khadija Stewart of Eco Vibes podcast is another really great up and coming uh, environmentalist here in the region. Uh, Leah Fauching of Co Coexistence Expeditions. Uh, so we have a lot of small island developing uh, states as they are called SIDS in the Caribbean. Um, I, I happen to be in a US territory right now, but I can tell you from being involved with a lot of a local initiatives, um, people living with the destruction uh, to their local ecosystems and communities know what where the issues are, right? So for example, here in St. Thomas, um, we have a huge problem with plastic pollution. You can go to any beach here and there's trash everywhere. And we've done a lot of beach cleanups and so forth, but that doesn't really get the root at the root of the problem. The root of the problem is there's just too much, there's a lot of problems, but there's too much plastic being sold. We don't have the, a great infrastructure for depositing trash. <laughs> and recycling. So there's a lot of infrastructure challenges. And that's information that, you know, maybe as a visitor, you can see the trash, but you don't know what, what the challenges are with the infrastructure. Anyway, I don't want to dominate too much of the time, but my really main point is that business uh, in the commercial sector and anyone who is trying to solve these problems needs to engage with grassroots initiatives and I think even go a step further in letting the grassroots initiatives lead the process and drive the process. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That is so valuable. Um, and our last question is for Salma. Um, how has your passion for marine life translated into your work and what active role can the youth take in marine conservation? Yep. Mm -hmm. Since I was 17 years old, I started to volunteer in an NGO called EPA Mexico here in La Paz. 
and into Eco Club uh, California Verdes as I got involved in the environmental education, sustainability, and conservation of wildlife topics. My passion and interest for this subject grew and I realized that we can be young leaders and take an active role in marine conservation. Everybody can develop and participate in the project of its communities. It doesn't have to be like big efforts because every action, every effort counts. And together as young leaders taking actions around the planet, we could make the green blue positive change that our planet needs. There are so many leaders and governments that say that the young and children are the future, but I think that we are the present and the planet, it is in our hands. We are a more conscious generation about all the environmental problems that are affecting our planet. And of course, we do not want an ocean with more microplastic pieces and fishes in 2050 or the loss of more species. We want a healthy planet, a planet where we live in respect and harmony with every single life. It doesn't matter if it is human, animal, or plant. So you can start organizing beach cleanups with your friends, volunteering with NGOs, or another type of conservation projects in your communities. I'm also participating in the monitoring of wildlife. Um, you don't need to be a marine biologist or scientist to act. As I said previously, every action or idea counts. And um, of course, the more actions, the more ideas and junk, it is better. As the other panelists said, we could, there are so many ideas like music, yoga, art. Um, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That is um, so valuable to hear um, about like the various ways to get involved, but also to hear part of your story. Um, so thank you so much to all four of you for answering my questions and for sharing all of your wisdom with us. I would now like to open the floor to our participants. I would now like to open the floor to our participants to ask um, any of the panelists a question. So um, I have the chat open on my laptop below. So um, if you would like to message in the chat or um, raise your hand, like use the raise your hand icon on Zoom, um, then we would be able to call on you to ask your question. That'd be great. Anna, Anna would you like to? Hi, how, how are you? That was a great discussion. And I have a question regarding um, those of us who don't live close to the ocean. What would you say is the most effective way for us to get involved? And what are the most effective actions we can take to protect the, the ocean? And it's directed to anyone who wants to answer it. <laughs> I think Christine wants to answer. Dr. Christine, if you'd like to go ahead. Oh, okay. We saw that you raised your hand. But somebody else is oh. raising their hand. I tried to lower it and then I raised the hand. <laughs> okay. I I, I can jump in. So um, I just put a, a link in the chat. This is a US-based organization, the Inland Ocean Alliance, but I think it should be expanded globally. So everybody, um, Again, you know, as we talk about the ocean, if you're seeing it daily and you live near the ocean, it is easy for it to be front of mind, but everybody does have a relationship with the ocean, whether you know it or not. And so I, I think a lot of inland initiatives can also be similar, right? So there can be focus on trash cleanup. There's focus on whatever local initiatives are happening uh, in order to uh, try to mitigate climate change. So global warming is does have a huge effect on the ocean and all of us are involved with that, right? It has a huge effect on the temperature of the, of the ocean and the creatures living in it and literally everything. So I think everybody needs to be trying to think about the ocean and also uh, educating themselves 
Uh, ocean literacy is really important. Unfortunately, many of us just don't get a lot of education about the ocean and about you know marine biodiversity in our schools. Um, and that's just a reality. So I think folks, probably everyone on this call already is thinking about it and can help educate others. Uh, so ocean concerns and issues and protection are all issues that affect everybody on this planet. And I really inc in, uh, encourage everyone to engage. And I know that honestly, uh, POP is doing a lot of work uh, and has a lot of opportunities for education and they're all free and they're virtual right now. Um, so I don't know if you're able to share any links, Anna, but there's a lot, a wealth of information available for everybody. And it's really fascinating and fun to learn about the ocean. Um, there's a lot of aquariums all over the world, which is a good way to kind of get a peek into it. Um, so I really, you know, would encourage anyone, regardless of where you live, uh, to, to get involved and to educate yourself and to try to educate others, because these are issues that affect everybody, whether it's kind of literally right in your face every day or not. Well, maybe maybe to add that is that, you know, we should always keep in mind that most oceans, uh, you know, end up in the sea. So that means if you are somehow involved in protecting your waterways, your lakes, your rivers, it will eventually also have an effect on our oceans. And, you know, that doesn't always have to be direct action, such as going and doing beach cleanups, but it's also sometimes about becoming political. Go out and vote for your government, right? Vote for the people that are doing the right things in the spaces that they should be doing. Um, make sure that your municipality is doing the right thing, your community. So, I mean, a lot of times it's, you know, this thing like think global, act local. Um, but I think there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different skill sets that could become important uh, for our oceans. And yeah, just uh, do whatever you can in, in the space that you're in. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask our panelists? Yes, um, I can see your hand up, Akir. Um, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Would you like to turn your microphone on? Hi. Um, personally, hi to Christine. <laughs> nice to see your face. Um, I just have a quick question. I live in Costa Rica, um, and right where I live, we just have this political issue of these um, regulations changing about construction um, and all of that. And my town village that I live in is specifically known for the Aribata um, of the sea turtles. And I've seen that many of the locals here, many of the tourists here, many of the expats who live here are very conscious of protecting the environment. They're very much in favor of wanting to do better for the environment, but due to lobbying and people with money, the, you know, the, <laughs> political levels are so swayed by just money. And it's just so discouraging when the locals don't want um, anything bad happening. When there's so much movement, there's so many petitions and protests that goes on to protect um, what we have. And then just like that, it's just money and policy and all of that that changes. And I just feel kind of powerless. So. I'm trying to word my question here, right? But what is a way in which I can be heard? Because whatever I do, I just feel like I'm so powerless in all of this and that I'm trying to make the changes. We're all trying to make the changes and none of it is just taking effect. So I don't know who I can direct that question to, but if someone could guide me, that'll be awesome. Well, I think you're touching on a problem that is definitely prevalent in, in our conservation space. And I don't, I do not have a solution. I think it touches a lot on the issue of social justice, on environmental racism, and that money unfortunately still rules the world. And I think that, I mean, at least in my, in my experience, a lot of times when a lot of people come together and there is a lot of noise around it, and you can make yourself heard. And I think if a lot of people catch on, actually that sometimes has the best effect because then even money can drown out the noise 
I mean, you can only buy so many people. So it's really about the masses, you know, it's, it's the little drops that make the, the big ocean. So, I mean, that's the reason I think we've all been working behind the scenes to try to get as many people as possible to talk about the issue. And I think this is really what you need to do. Talk to the press in your country, try to make it go outside of your country because I don't know if you remember when, when our friend Heide was, was killed, you know, the government tried to pretty much kind of do kind of cover it up and don't do much about it. But because the whole world was watching, they were pressured into doing something. And I think this could be a case such as, I mean, I can't make any promises, but that's the only thing that I know that sometimes has an effect is if the world is watching, governments tend to do different things as if they think that nobody is actually taking notice of what they're trying to do. Yeah, I want to jump into and dovetail on that. I uh, I think organizing, uh, finding other like-minded people, they're, you know, again, grassroots initiatives, but getting together and organizing. So I, I agree, it's hard not to feel completely overwhelmed and completely powerless. And that's why I was talking about grassroots initiatives, right? So local people organizing together. I just, um, as an aside, I'm in the process of reading this really incredible book called The Purpose of Power by Alicia Garza, who uh, founded the Black Lives Matter movement. And there's a lot of really good information with it. She tells her story of founding this movement that has become internationally known and how it started very grassroots. And I really recommend it because I think a lot of what she's talking about applies to any movement. Um, and really, we need to look at this. This is a movement, right? So this is about people trying to protect our ocean and our local environments. Um, I think you could learn a lot from that. So I highly recommend reading it. I put the link in the, in the chat. It's called The Purpose of Power. And Aki, maybe you want to put the petition link into the um, chat as well, if people are interested of signing, because yeah, you have an international audience and maybe, um, I don't know, Priyanka, we can also put it in the, in the chat in, I don't know, wherever you're streaming to right now. Um, thank you so much for the audience questions. We are going to finish with one question, um, like a really quick answer from um, all of our panelists. And the question is, what advice or tips would you give to someone who is keen on enjoying the marine conservation space? Um, so if maybe we can start with Salma. Mm, I think that is a good question. Mm. I'm gonna take the advice or tip that I received from one of the women that I most admire in the world. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to dive with Sylvia Earle. She's an amazing oceanographer. And she told me that some people will try to underestimate you for the simple fact that you are a woman, you are young, you are a minorist, but in the ocean, you will find the passion and strength to continue doing what you love um, most day by day. And of course, there are going to be obstacles and difficulties that arise along the way. But in this way, you will make realize how strong and intelligent you are surprising yourself every day. And of course, empowering yourself, your community, the people that is around you. So that will be my advice for everyone. Thank you. I think that is such amazing advice. Um, Utama, would you like to offer your piece of wisdom as well, please? Yeah, I think just to also to, to not forget that we are all part of the same ocean of life and that we're all interconnected. So acting um, with everything that you do and everything you even think and feel, you have to understand that it's affecting the whole and that um, why not choose optimism? Why not choose taking the next step in your local initiatives? Um, sign a petition like the, you know, MAPS petition, but stay active and stay alert and imagine, use the power of your imagination to imagine what you really want. What will the world be like 
when all the doors open, even in the next few months, you know, as, as the world shifts, what do you want? Not the same that was, what do you want in the future? What do you dream? You know, Martin Luther King had a dream. John Lennon said, imagine, we all know the power of our imagination to make a better world. So act on that. Thank you so much. I'm really liking your perspective on life at the moment. <laughs> um, I would also like to ask um, Marissa to share her advice as well, please. I agree with everything that this amazing panel of women is, is saying. Um, I mean, the reality is that we are in a... <laughs> in a system that uh, is, is designed to oppress most of us that are on this call. And it is really important when you feel stifled and oppressed and that your opinion, your actions don't matter to not, to not let that take over and to really meditate, to close your eyes, to do whatever you need to do to come back to yourself and realize that you do have power. You have power over your own self and you can influence others as well um, by being true to yourself. So I think coming back to that in every situation and remembering what you stand for and why, and that whatever you do is makes a difference. And that, and I really want to emphasize this, everybody belongs in this movement. So again, regardless of what your profession is, regardless of your age, regardless of where you're located, everybody belongs here and don't let anybody tell you differently. <laughs> so that that's my advice. I, I have a very, um, one of my, I love Rumi and um, one of his favorite, my favorite quotes is related to this is that you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. Yay. So, <laughs> there's a lot to work with there. So everybody here belongs and everybody else belongs in this movement. And that is, I think is the most important thing that we can keep in mind today. Thank you so much. That's such a beautiful notion. Um, I'd like to finish with Christine's um, piece of wisdom. Yeah, I mean, definitely already some good advice that came from the other panelists. And I think besides also that Marissa said, you know, everybody belongs and shouldn't feel powerless. I totally agree with that. And moreover, we actually need different skill sets, right? So I really want everybody to be aware that, uh, you know, even though maybe the marine scientists were the ones that spearheaded or the ocean explorers spearheaded the movements because we were the ones that first saw what was happening. But at this point, we are not people that know everything, right? That is necessary to organize ourselves to actually make this movement a movement. Um, we are actually not people people. So we need everybody. We need engineers, we need marketing people, we need, we need everybody. So that means, you know, even though you might have a passion for, for a different type of profession, um, it doesn't hinder you from, from being part. And um, I think it's also never too late. So even if you're already having, having had a career, you probably have a lot of experiences that, you know, the movement can draw from. And maybe because it's still resonating a little bit with what, what Aki said, I think, you know, it is so important because you are confronted in the movement with so much negativity as well that you can't avoid if you want to actually solve the issue. Find your people, right? Find people that, that raise you up, that build you up, that you can bounce ideas with, that um, you know, you're able to share your events to as well, because otherwise you will be stuck somewhere and you will feel very, very alone. And it's so important to know that you're not alone because we're not alone. There's so many people all over the world that have the same goal. And it's very empowering to think about it and be coming back to that, to that fact that, you know, hey, if I'm in the moment of need. Um, there will be other people that are able, able to lift me up and help me out. So I highly recommend find your community closest to you and uh, connect to the global community. There's so much ways of how we can do that nowadays. I mean, social media, one of the biggies, of course. Um, so yeah, I think uh, just go out and do something. That's all we can say, you know, it doesn't need to be perfect. We are all not perfect, but we need really millions of people that are participating in the entire movement. Thank you.
thank you so much to all four of you for sharing today. I, I am definitely feeling very inspired um, and I'm hoping that everyone else who watched today is. So thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to share with us and to share your really personal stories and experiences with us. I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Ash to share um, any closing remarks. Thank you. You're very kind. I, I, you know, after this absolutely profoundly inspirational discussion, there's little I can add uh, other than to say, first of all, um, you know, it, this, this is this coming together just means the world to me. Um, today, of course, is a very special day, but to be honest, every single day is special, especially when we are together and, and our family and are celebrating being family. So I just want to thank all of you. And I, I, I echo the beautiful word sentiments and sentiments that all of you have shared. We do need to come together. We do need to do this collectively. We do need to be connected in our values, in our initiatives, in our work. And I want to also recognize that the, the concept of making a difference on the ground in a participatory manner where we bring together local communities and people so that it really belongs to all of us, which is really what it should be, and have sustainable responses. Because, you know, we talk about sustainability, but it's so important that we be sustainable in our response. And to be honest, the only way that a sustainable response can ever be established is if we go ground up and we keep it participatory and we keep it people led. So I just want to say, um, you know, this is an very, very important move in that direction. And you're very much at the helm of it. And I just want to say that I, I did put a message in there and I mean it from my heart that I really, truly love you all so, so, so much. And, and my heart right now is flooded like an ocean with love, respect, and gratitude for all of you and, and forever is. And I just want to say that, you know, you inspire me. And, um, and I know we have lots more to do, but, um, you know, we're, we're well on our way. And I know with the love, the conviction and the passion that our beautiful family here has, uh, embraces and literally oozes, we will go far. And I just want to say, I, I truly respect you all and thank you so much. And thank you, um, Steph, for, for moderating and, and steering this discussion. It's been absolutely beautiful. Marissa, for um, leading us to the POP, uh, you know, Ocean Initiative. You've been sort of the, the, you for the one who came up with this idea and look where you've brought it and you're, you're the heart of it. So I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, I want to also thank Salma. Salma, you are, uh, you know, you're on, on the ground doing so much to make a difference, to protect the ocean, the biodiversity we, I know I, I, we are dependent on. And, and it's not that the planet needs us at all. You know, we are the ones who need to do this uh, in order to secure our own future. So I just want to thank you because you're very much the boots on the ground doing so much and, 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 and an, an extremely inspirational young leader. Uttama, um, you know, I just want to say that, you know, that the Parvati Foundation is just uh, so, so close to our hearts. And I want to echo every word of what you said. It is, I know you have really pinpointed where we can have the most impact, where we have the, the window of opportunity, though, though I agree with you um, closing rapidly, but all the more reason for us to bring our love and passion together and, and make a difference. And thank you so much for leading us in that direction. Thank you for being such a beautiful voice and such a, um, a force. Um, and I just wanna say we will not only sign uh, the petition, we have connected with um, leaders who I believe are very, very committed and, and we can only do this now, it's now or never. So I just wanna say we're, we're, we're in this together with you and we will work to make it happen. Um, I also wanna thank Christine. Christine, you're just such an inspiration to us and to the, the, the 1.8 billion youth of the world. Honestly, uh, you know, you are someone who 
uh, again, um, you know, you're on the ground making a difference every single day. But I want to thank you because you share your you share your learning, your 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 wisdom and and the the values that you bring to the fore. So um, this is really what has inspired us. Um, throughout the waves of change here at the festival and all the work that you do on the ground in so many places. So I just want to say that, you know, the, the pop movement, um, the youth in Latin America and certainly around the world come together in Africa, Asia, you know, the U.S., Canada, elsewhere, come together to um, to, to strengthen the, 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 the collective resolve. And I want to thank you for your example and your leadership. Uh, so with that, I just want to conclude and also thank our beautiful mentors uh, who have been the ones who've, um, Summer is, is one of our mentors and she's doing so much on the ground. I want to thank her. I know I don't see her here, just but, but I want to say, I want to thank our mentors for conceptualizing, for re realizing Priyanka, Komal, uh, Trisha, Norma Ji, Meda, you know, uh, and I want to thank Hermano I Ivan and Kevin. Uh, Sherry and uh, certainly Anna, who's been doing so much to drive this initiative and all those who have joined us here today. Thank you so very much. Um, and you guys are just exquisitely beautiful. Thank you. And let's just keep pushing ahead and do this and do this with um, true blue hearts. Thank you. Before we close, I just was wondering if everyone can switch on their cameras, we can take a snap uh, just to commemorate World Ocean Day. I think it's been an incredible panel. So if everyone can just switch on their camera for two seconds, hello, Dr. Norma. Uh, whoever can, uh, there is a wait for a second more. Uh, anyone else wants to switch on? Dr. Norma. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think Rishad's camera is. Can, can someone help Dr. Norma, please, with this uh, print screen button on the Spanish keyboard? Anna. Uh, three, two, I'm just going to click three, two, one. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Happy World Ocean Day once again. Happy World Ocean Day and every thank single day. And thank you and God bless you and see you soon. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good meeting, everyone. Good. Thank you.